You'll wanna watch this video all the way through if you wanna go from beginner to expert at Facebook ads because each section is going to build upon the last one. Like these are the skills I think are the most important for running profitable ads and we are gonna cover every single one. We're actually gonna launch an entire campaign in this video from start to finish. We're gonna do brainstorming, actually write all the copy, learn copywriting, create all the video and photo ads, and then launch it into a full campaign and learn what every single thing means and how to structure it into a full ad campaign. So we have a finished ad campaign by the end of this epic training. Now here's what we're gonna cover and the time code, but highly recommend you watch the whole thing your first time. Let's jump in right now. We're gonna start by doing some brainstorming and finding inspiration. And this should really be an ongoing process. For my customers and clients, we're doing like 10, 20, 30, sometimes even 100 new ads per month just because you need to constantly be innovating and keep things fresh and working really well. So how do you even get started? The first thing you can do is go to facebook.com slash ads slash library. And we wanna to switch to search all. And you can look up your competitors. Um, you can also look up uh, people in your industry. So I do a lot with like food and beverage. So we can just do hello fresh for this example. You can choose the country and the platform. I used to like, usually like to keep it at all platforms. So what you can do is you can actually see the ads that they're running. Now, know that this isn't necessarily all the ads that they're running. Uh, for some reason, sometimes stuff doesn't show up, like some ad campaigns I've looked up on here where I know we've got like 100 ads going and it shows like two. So they may be running a lot more than this, but this gives us a good indication of the various things that they're running. You can look at like colors, the type of photos, you know, typically people use like photos of people work really well. Uh, but they've got these really nice uh, product shots. We also want to look at sort of a ratio of photos to video. So if it's like a course or something like that, informational coach consultant, uh, probably like 80% are going to be videos. Uh, if it's something very, very visual and simple and easy to understand, like HelloFresh or food, I find sometimes with that you have like 60, 70, 75% of them our photos. So you can actually watch all these videos. Uh, what I like to do is I like to take a screenshot of the various photos. Uh, I like to do a screenshot because then I can actually see like the button and the headline and things like that. And then I always move them to, I have like an inspiration folder on my desktop. And if it's a video, uh, you can actually start playing the video and then right click, at least on Chrome, and you can actually save the video. So I'm constantly updating a creative folder, and it's not necessarily to copy people, but it's to just provide inspiration, and sometimes you can innovate it or make it your own and make it even better than the initial one. But I always recommend looking up someone who's kind of a big player in your industry, even if they're not a direct competitor. You do want to think about sometimes companies of different sizes have different priorities, like if you're a new, a soft drink company, you may just be trying to get as many sales as possible, whereas someone like Coke may just kind of build brand awareness and get people to like their brand and stuff like that. Now, it starts with the most recent ads, and then at the bottom is gonna be the ones launched the furthest back. So I always like to look at what ads are the furthest back, what's the earliest ones that we have. The reason I do this is this was launched in July, you know, I'm recording this uh, late October. So it's been running close to half a year, not quite half a year. If this ad was not making money, they would not be running it. <laughs> You're not gonna run an ad that is unprofitable for over half a year. Whereas some of the stuff that just launched, you really, scrolling back up to the top, have no idea They've just launched this, it may tank for them. It may be losing them money and they just have it going for a couple days. So stuff at the bottom is actually a better indicator of what's made them the most money or what they've seen is the most effective. Uh, with video, 
you want to kind of see the elements they're including. You also want to kind of see the different lengths, uh, see if what platforms they're running on and on, things like that. You can also do like a spreadsheet or something like that. Uh, like you can save like headlines or body text or uh, different call to actions or things like that, stuff that you find inspiring. If it's mainly just the text, that's another way to keep track of what's working really well. So we have a good idea of the various ads that they're doing. Uh, you know, this ad is just nine seconds long, but we don't really know the audiences that they're using. And we also don't know, you know, if this ad was shown to someone who visited one of the pages or started a checkout or liked them on Facebook or anything like that, or if it's just shown to huge, broad audiences, people who have never heard of them before. So I actually like also going to the website and kind of seeing, okay, do they have an offer, uh, the way it's structured. Uh, sometimes I'll even go to check out and then not complete the checkout because a lot of times they'll have like an abandoned cart. And I'll look at the different pages because it's likely that I will start receiving retargeting ads from them. So then I can kind of keep track of this. I can add it to the, the spreadsheet, you know, to kind of track along a single brand, like the different ads that they showed to me. I actually almost always buy their product, buy the competitor's products, just so I can see kind of what kind of emails they send, how frequently they send them, what happens if I abandon the cart, just that whole process. You really want to think about if they're doing something that you're not doing, that's driving a lot of purchases, they're going to outcompete you. So you want as few things where you're falling behind as possible. Okay, so we got this pop-up offer right here. So I would, you know, write it down. You can make a Google Doc or a spreadsheet just for HelloFresh if that's who you're targeting. Uh, so they're trying to get the email to give you a bonus. Um, if you do this top one, they, you get the same kind of opt-in. They have a countdown timer, which I'm sure <laughs> never actually expires. It's always available. So when I'm scrolling through Facebook, I am always just saving things that look really cool, things that stop me from scrolling, that catch my eye, things like that. So I have, you know, a list of, you know, a hundred different ads that I found really um, inspiring or attention grabbing or things like that. That's actually not a bad image, uh, bright colors that pop. So what you can do, you can actually save the link so you can save it for later to view. Um, I usually do screenshot just because sometimes they delete an ad and then you can't access it anymore. Actually, under the ads library, you can actually copy a link to the ad so you can send someone a link to the ad. The only problem is if it no longer becomes active, if they pause the ad, sometimes you can't see it again in the future, which is a big bummer, which is why I always like to save a screenshot and actually have it on my hard drive because that's never going anywhere. So the final thing you wanna do is actually go to your Facebook page and Instagram page and look through all of the comments and see what people are talking about, uh, what frustrations they have, um, anything that's keeping them from buying, uh, testimonials, people saying great things, people highlighting the things that they like. Um, it's much, much better if it's actually for your page, your actual customer talking. Um, if you don't have a following, I'd recommend building one up, building that community. It's really helpful for running Facebook ads, Instagram ads. If you don't have a following, actually look up one of your competitors and read through all of their comments. So I just pulled up the very first thing that showed up for me. So I'm going to pretend that this is my page and my brand. So I'd go through and just look through the comments and actually spend 20 minutes, 30 minutes, depending how many there are. Uh, seeing what people are discussing. Uh, this can also give you ideas for audiences. You know, this person, this woman says she's a nurse, keeps me full during my shift. So I would definitely take a screenshot of that. And I would also grab the text and punch it into my thing, like testimonials, things for my page. Um, it's up to you how you want to organize this, but just so you're saving that so you can reference it at any point in the future, because this is knowing your audience, really understanding what they care about, the reasons they aren't buying, um, you know, where can I read reviews? So making that really obvious. 
Um, and just the more time you spend on this, the better you'll get to know your audience, the better you'll get in the next step, which is actually like writing the copy and planning out the ads. So I would recommend grabbing 15, 20, 30 ads for inspiration, other people who are competitors in your industry, any other ads that just are really inspiring, really creative. Uh, I usually try to go through Facebook really quickly and see what stops my scroll, stops me in my tracks that I want to pay attention to, or even something Anything you click on, definitely save because that actually inspired you to click on it to learn more. And then actually go to your comments section for Facebook and Instagram if you have any sort of following and go through and read all of people's frustrations, their discussions, their testimonials, uh, their who they are, you know, what they care about. Uh, really jot that down. If you don't have a following, actually go to your competitors and figure that out. All right, so now we have that research done, we're ready to start actually mapping out the different ads that we are going to create. So we wanna think about what's the budget um, for our initial test. Um, so how much are we gonna spend in the first like five days, seven days? Um, I don't like having a fixed budget for a full campaign because I really like scaling up the spend if things are doing well, turning things off or pausing them or testing new stuff if it's not doing well. Uh, so the spend day to day really changes, but for the first week, you should have some idea of how much you're comfortable losing, how much you're going to test, and you wanna launch stuff and then at least give it like five days, seven days to really see how it's performing because Facebook kind of optimizes and things like that. You won't really know after one day um, how well it's doing, unless it's just a colossal failure, then you may need to pull the plug. So for this example, I'm gonna say we are aiming for sales for $50. That's gonna be our target for this campaign. It's actually so much harder, especially in certain industries, if your target is like getting customers for $10 or $15, it's just gotten really competitive. And later on, we're gonna go into some different ways that you can actually pay a lot more to get a customer, pay a lot more to get a sale because that's gonna be crucial when you're trying to compete on Facebook. So, all right, we're trying to get sales for $50. I actually spend my own money promoting other people's products, so I need to know these numbers really, really well. I always write down like, what am I willing to lose in the first week? Because not every campaign is gonna work. Uh, sometimes you try things and it just doesn't happen at all. So I'm gonna say I'm willing to lose $1,000. And let's say I'm going to spend um, $1,500 in the first week. So at the end of this week, let's say I spent $1,500 and I got $1,200 in sales. So I'd be down $300 and I could kill off some of the ads that weren't doing well. I could bring in some new ads, do some different tests, test some new audiences. Uh, I wouldn't consider that a failure. And then let's say the next time I ran it, I'd be really aiming to at least break even, get those $50 per purchase, if not even better. Okay, so my budget is $1,500 and I'm willing to spend $50 to get a sale. So if we bring out our trusty little calculator, uh, 1500 divided by 50. So I'm expecting to spend $1,500. I'm hoping to get at least 30 sales from this. So I'm looking at the overall budget to try to figure out how many ads that I should create for this test, because you actually wanna make sure that you're able to put enough money into an ad to actually test it to see if it did well. So our target here, we're trying to get purchases for $50, generate 30 sales. So if I were to create 60 different ads, you know, we could only put $25 in spend toward each ad. And we'd really have no idea if the ad was effective. You always wanna spend at least the amount that is your target amount per sale. So in this case, $50, because if you start spending money toward an ad, and it's spent $25 and there's no sale generated, you actually have no idea if that ad did well or not because you could keep running it. Once you spend $35, it generates a sale. Once you spend $45, it spends, generates another sale and that ad could be super profitable. You just wouldn't know it until you've hit at least your target for that ad. So 30 sales, I would probably do something like six ads or seven ads uh, that way we can actually put some money into each of them, actually do a legitimate test. 
Um, and hopefully each of those ads would generate like four or five sales based off that. If you want some input directly from me on how much you should be spending, how many ads you should be creating, I could definitely give my input. Leave a comment down below. And while you're there, make sure to like and subscribe. That really helps me out. All right, are you ready to start creating these ads? Copywriting is the key to successful Facebook ads. The words that you're using in your headlines, your descriptions, uh, in your videos, um, text overlaid on your videos and photos. This is so crucial and you have to get it right. One of the worst things that you can do in Facebook is just being incredibly boring. You want to inspire some sort of emotion, you know, make people build up curiosity, uh, make people smile, make them laugh. Uh, it can even be, it's a little harder. You have to be a little more skilled to do like sadness or frustration or anger properly. And there's also some stuff that's not allowed on Facebook. Uh, I do have a full video on that, but I will be covering some of that in this video stuff to avoid to get avoid getting your account shut down or banned. I want you to think about online dating apps, even if you've never been on one. On those apps, if you send the first message, hi, or hey, or how's it going, you're just gonna blend in with everyone else and the chances that anyone is going to notice that or respond to that is close to zero. You'd actually be much better off uh, doing something, even something random like off the wall or just building curiosity like, wow, I don't believe it, dot, dot, dot. Something like that actually makes people want to engage or learn more or read more because there's a part of the brain that's just like, well, what can't they believe? What is it that uh, is shocking to them or is exciting? So one of the big mistakes that people make is on their Facebook ads, they try to sell the entire product on Facebook. So they say, hey, here's the product. It's so amazing. Uh, here's all the features. Here's all the benefits. You really need this. You gotta go get it. The challenge is people need to take a lot of steps to actually make the purchase. So they see the ad, they go to the web page. they'll likely wanna read more about it. Uh, they add it to their cart, they go to checkout, they punch in their credit card, all of that. So really, I found a lot of the times it's a little bit more effective to actually sell the next step to convince people to visit the page, to learn more. So a lot of times curiosity has to be a part of that where maybe you give them some info, but maybe you tease like a feature or something else that people really wanna learn more. So you do want the people to click to be people who are qualified to be a customer. So you probably wanna include a little bit about the product, but it could definitely be something like these protein packed potato chips are disrupting a $10 billion industry. And then people have to click more to like learn how uh, they, they could be really curious about like how it's changing it. Um, or it could be like learn why people are raving about this protein packed uh, potato chip. So people think that the word you is just completely forbidden and that's not entirely true, but you definitely want to be careful because you can't call out people's attributes, meaning you can't target Jewish men and be like, hey, are you a Jewish man that is in college or something like that? That's not allowed on Facebook. Uh, you definitely can't be really negative. Like, are you tired of being fat and lazy? That's not gonna fly. Also on Facebook, uh, people give reactions and can report stuff. Uh, so even if it somehow did get approved, um, you would probably just get pulled because people would be downvoting it and responding really negatively to it. But you could do something like, are you eating healthier but missing potato chips? And people who that applies to are probably gonna be amazing for your product. And those people are like, oh man, I was just, I feel exactly this way. It really resonates with how they are feeling. Uh, other questions, you know, that make people be like, oh man, uh, it could be like, how much money is leaky faucets costing you? Or if you, suddenly there's a question in people's mind and they're like, well, how much is it costing me? I really need to know. That's, that's really pertinent information for me to figure out. So something that's pretty common is rather than jumping into pushing a product immediately, we'll do a helpful article, which it's called a pre-sell article. Um, so I highly recommend you try this out at some point. So let's say you have an acne product. Um, rather than just saying, hey, this is the best acne cream ever. You need to buy it. Here's the checkout page. 
you know, you can say five little known strategies to combat acne. And then you list out and it has helpful information for people. It's really useful. It's got your branding on it. Um, and then one of those includes your product um, and then your products linked there. And then you can link to your product again at the end. And then we are gonna add the people who read that article to have them see future ads because now they're a lot more engaged. They're a lot more likely to buy. And that can work really, really well because sometimes people kind of pull back if you just immediately go for the sale, uh, especially if it's something a little more expensive. If, if it's like a $200 teeth whitening, you just have to think always from customers perspectives, you know, are they going to be just scrolling through? And then all of a sudden it's like, Hey, this teeth whitening is $200. It's amazing. They're like, Oh yeah, I'm sold. Click on the page, go to checkout, buy right away. It often just takes several different steps. We're going to go into that when we set up the exact structure, the exact ads. You also want to just think about, it's called social proof. When you really show that a lot of people really like this or are interested, it's popular. Uh, so for one product, you know, They've sold millions and millions. So definitely we highlighted that, that millions of people uh, have used it, have bought it. Um, in terms of reviews, you can say, hey, this has over 300,000 five-star reviews. Um, learn about the product that people are raving about. Um, people don't want to miss out on something and they don't really want to have this really hot product that other people love and use and are really into and they're just out of the loop. So it's interesting with Facebook ads, you have the headline, like the main text that people see, uh, the text down below, but if it's a photo or, or a video, you can also put text like at the top or on the photo. So you'd really want those to be just suck people in, especially with a video where they see that text and say, oh, I have to watch this. Um, you know, if the text is, suppose this happened to you on your wedding day, they really am go are gonna wanna find out more and actually watch some of that video or if it's on the page, actually click on that page. We also wanna think about what is every single reason that someone would buy this product? And what is every single reason that someone would not buy this product? What are they complaining about? You know, a lot of people, they add something to their cart and then they don't make it to the end. They have second thoughts. They think maybe I should ask my significant other. There's some reason that keeps them from buying. Running Facebook ads, doing marketing, it's basically just doing the whole sales thing to a whole bunch of people at once. So if you're doing sales, you're trying to you know, highlight the things that people care about, but also find out every single thing that they are going to object to. So you wanna think about every single objection someone would have to buying your product. Three really common ones is like the price that people are just hesitant to spend the money to really feel like it is worth it, like the value is there, or like they'll save money or time in other areas to make it actually worth it. Um, another really common one is just the quality. So, you can have a product and they say, oh, that sounds really great, um, but I had a motorized scooter that just broke down after three weeks, it was such a pain. Uh, why is this one any different? Um, is your product gonna work? Is it gonna actually do everything it says? So you can make a lot of claims, but how can you actually offer proof or other people saying that or really demonstrate exactly how your product is different from other ones? where people are like, okay, yeah, I actually do think that that is worth it. The goal is never to sell to someone that is not a good fit for, um, but people, even people who are the perfect customers, the perfect buyers are probably not just gonna immediately see it and then check out and make the purchase. They wanna actually get some more info so they feel actually confident in their purchase. So definitely having all those lists of every reason people wouldn't buy is so important because we're going to include that in our ads, especially the ads that we show to people who like visited the page or started a checkout and didn't actually finish. That's going to be central to that. We talked about not being boring. You also want to think about not being too corporate. So actually speaking like everyday people speak, uh, sometimes I actually pull out like a voice recorder. So I actually talk just in like a casual, fun way. You know, you can have some personality, uh, that emotion. You don't have to be quote unquote professional. Anytime that you can make a message more customized to a specific group, the better. So if we wrote down, okay, nurses is who we're targeting, 
will definitely want to include some things that are very, very specific to them because we can launch a campaign that is only shown to nurses and only speaks directly to them. If you do have an existing list of customers, I would actually look through that list of people and write down anything that you notice about them, you know, age ranges, gender, uh, profession is a really big one, um, interest, even like the type of magazines and things like that that they read. Anytime you can build in some sort of guarantee or like free returns or anything like that, that just builds a lot of confidence for people. Like with my courses, I don't want anyone to pay who's not happy with it. So 30 days later, I have a no questions asked money back guarantee. Um, so whatever works for your business, but um, don't think of it as a loss because you could generate twice as many sales by having an amazing guarantee um, and then you lose 6%, but you end up way, way ahead because you generated so many sales. I also think like comparing and contrasting can be pretty effective. So you wanna think about your competition. Uh, often I don't directly call them out by name um, but it can kind of just be you versus the competitors. So let's say the potato chip example, you just take your average bag of potato chips and it's like them, oh, they've got no protein and we've got six grams of protein. They've got this many calories, this much fat, uh, where you can directly see the two comparing contrasted. It's a really cool visual way and good way to use text to show, hey, here's how we're different than all of the competitors, than the potato chip industry, just for this example. You do want to think about urgency and scarcity. So maybe a limited time sale or like a limited amount in stock. That can be something that really drives a whole lot more sales, but I don't think that you want to fake it and have fake countdown timers that don't actually expire or pretend there's a limited amount in stock. I think you want to actually strategically plan when you have unique sales or things like that. You definitely want to avoid just generic buzzwords that don't really mean anything. So for example, we have the leading product, we have all of the solutions, our product is unique, our product is innovative, cutting edge. That really doesn't describe basically anything at all. Uh, you really want your ads to be very, very specific to you, something that text and headlines that your competitors could never use because they're unique to you and your audience. Going back to potato chip example, if you have eight grams of protein and your competitors don't, and you highlight that, that's not an ad that they could run. It's very specific, it's quantifiable, it really demonstrates how you are different than them. I'd actually really encourage you to get really creative and zany and out there because sometimes that really catches people's attention. If you want to put on a superhero cape and smash watermelons with a sledgehammer, if you can do a good job tying it into your message and your sales, like that's something that could really catch people's attention. It could completely flop, but often the ones that do very best are ones where you're actually taking a risk versus just going with super generic, not creative at all. People are generally trying to avoid things or get things. So, you know, they could be trying to gain wealth. They could be trying to gain health, um, the attraction of other people, um, looking young, things like that. They could be trying to avoid, you know, health issues, um, financial ruin, um, being humiliated. You can't go too extreme or heavy handed on Facebook. You don't want people to overly feel bad, but you want to think about what's their ultimate desire. You also want to think about avoiding too many technical specifications. Uh, some audiences may care. So if you're selling a computer, uh, if you're targeting really tech savvy people, you could talk about gigahertz and all these different things, but just realize if you're going to a larger audience, make sure at least 95% of people understand what the word is and try to avoid technical things as much as possible. You need to talk about like the emotional thing or what they'll be able to accomplish. It's a computer. Um, okay, the computer is really fast. What does that allow them to do? Um, they can get their work done two hours earlier, which gives them time to spend with their family. Uh, they can avoid like banging on the keyboard stuff loads instantly. Like think about the real world impact. You know, if you're selling someone a hammer, 
they are gonna be excited about the projects that they can take on, you know, the way that they can transform their house, build a deck, things like that, um, which gets them other things they want, like respect from the neighbors or from their spouse or from all sorts of things. So really try to go deep with what people's core desires are with everything. It's also important not to just be solely focused on a single product and think about the different offers that you could create for people. You know, you could do a bundle of products that people buy for $100, but you really are creating like the story and the excitement and the vision for what people can do with that, with that bundle or with that group of products or things like that. So we're gonna go into creating and structuring that offer a little bit later, but definitely keep that in your mind. Stories are incredibly powerful. I first learned about this from Russell Brunson, but really thinking about the emotional journey you went on to kind of have the revelation of how amazing the product was. Uh, so that journey where you were like struggling with something and you got the product and that offered solution, uh, taking people through that whole emotional roller coaster and getting them into the same emotional state so you almost lead them up to the epiphany of why they need the product rather than just saying, oh, this product's amazing. For example, if it's like a new computer really talking about what life was like, how it was frustrating, everything was taking forever, uh, your boss was yelling at you, things like that, and just the various emotional things you went through, and then all of a sudden you learned how much things could change with the new product and then you kind of have that after state you got the computer things vastly changed the ways your life are better but you got to get emotional and talk through those frustrations and that revelation and get people to emotionally feel that with you at the same time people also like having certain secrets or information that other people don't um, for example like find out why seven out of ten houses don't sell so I'll share this spreadsheet with you so you can have access. You wanna to go to file and then make a copy. You just wanna fill out every reason someone would buy, people wouldn't buy, a uh, rough draft of different headlines, different stories you can tell, uh, different audiences, or just any bonus information you've thought about. Uh, these do not need to be perfect. They don't need to be polished. We'll get that once we create our ads, but you do kind of need all this when you're going to create the ads for the very first time. A lot of people when they're running ads, they think, here's my product, how do I sell more of it? But they don't think about kind of like the overall offer. So what you can do, you can add bonuses or extra things or upsells or things that are only available for a limited time. You can also add like bundles of different things if it's a physical product and just think about how you can create an offer that's really, really irresistible. Uh, like when I first had my 14 day challenge, it was just the one thing but kind of over time I thought about what kind of bonuses could I add to sweeten it and at what point is it like, okay, it's too hard to say no to, uh, the value is there and just over time I've added more and more things that add value onto that. So upsells are really, really powerful. What you can do is you have your product and then you offer a series of other products at like a special discount or that they can only find on the checkout page or on the thank you page or things like that. So it's pretty common, you know, you have a $30 product, it costs you $15 to make it, $15 profit, but then you say, hey, do you wanna add all of these to your order? and you offer this really amazing bundle that people can get for $100 extra. And not everyone is gonna take you up, but if let's say like 20% of people add it, usually the cost is actually lower on that, but you know, we've nearly doubled our profit and now we can spend twice as much to acquire a new customer. Now, instead of saying, hey, I need purchases for $50, we can go up to 25. So you can definitely test out these different offers. There's so many different ways to structure an offer. So let's say people start raving about the wax. You could try having the wax as the main offering and then adding this to the bundle. You could try switching out things on the bundle or you could say, hey, if you order three of these, you get a free thing of wax or free other thing. If you sign up for a subscription, you get a 10% discount and you get this added bonus thing. There's so many different ways to do it. And if you're just constantly thinking, here's my main product and I can only spend $15 to break even and that's everything. Everyone who's structuring like these amazing offers and bundles and bonuses and things like that are gonna outcompete you and are going to be able to spend more money to acquire a customer. 
Look for the link down below, like and subscribe while you're there. Let me get into some awesome tools that I use. Let's create some awesome ads. I'm gonna show you how to create them, but also some techniques and strategies that have worked really well through writing all my ad campaigns. So I'm gonna show you some recommended tools. I'll also highlight some free options if you don't wanna spend anything. But this first one, Afio, is so cool. It's like a million different animations. They're really well suited for ads and just make the whole process a lot faster, but also provide a lot of cool templates and inspiration. It's relatively affordable. I think it's $12 a month paid yearly or 19 a month if you do month to month and they have a free thing to try it out. It's got a watermark, um, but you can definitely test it out. So the fake product that I'm going to promote is protein packed pancakes. And then you can look through, so you can just see what grabs your attention. Um, you want it to be kind of on brand, you know, with the different, you may have brand colors, you can kind of change it to those, but uh, thinking about, you know, for certain things, uh, you know, luxury or neon or bright will work really well, but you want to think about, okay, if it's like a food brand, maybe it's organic, maybe a bit healthy. So you can actually like search uh, we could do food, start with that, kind of look through the different tags, um, and then choose some potential options. So that's not bad. And these are just a starting place. Okay, this one is speaking to me. It's just like bright, it's fun, there's some good movement. Uh, some of them, there's a lot more like less that's editable, but I think this will have quite a bit. So you have all the different layers. Uh, this applies if you're using like Final Cut, um, if you're using iMovie, anything like that, After Effects, Premiere. Uh, so you can actually change the duration. Let's say we want, we want this to be 15 seconds. And then in the timeline, you can actually make sure that all of these are gonna last until 15 seconds. Okay, cool. And then you can choose the type of animation that they do. So it actually like demos it. So we could say, let's do fly in on that. And then you can preview it. So now that flies in. So you do have photos, videos, mass library, and it did take a little while to customize it. Any, that's always true with video, but now we have this custom animation. We can put it in our own fonts and colors and stuff like that. Um, and then under music, you can actually add, kind of search by genre. Let's do, or by name. So let's do like epic. Okay, we can use this, something good. Actually you put that and now when we play this, We'll do our custom animation. And here's the pretty cool thing. So you can download it as a video or as an image. So you can actually use this program to create just images too, like the way you want it to look. So you can also create your images here. I'm gonna download this video since we've created this one. I'm gonna do it as high quality MP4. Now I'm going to resize this to vertical and click apply. You can see it's not too hard to adjust the levels. I'll bring this text up because a lot of time in stories, the bottom is taken up by like a call to action. So you really want to think about the best way for it to look good on the format. So I actually created another copy of the photo and then highlighted the two pancakes separately. So it was pretty easy to adjust. Obviously all of this takes time. So 15 seconds is like perfect for a story. You want to either want to do like right at 15 or right at 30, depending on what it is. If it's just kind of like text, you can do just like that. So it kind of like zooms in and it was super easy to transfer. I'm going to download the story version as a video and let's do highest quality mp4 that works really well for facebook 
If you're doing like testimonials, like people talking or training or coaching or anything like that, Clipscribe is really awesome. So basically, uh, I think it is similar in pricing. Like I just have the $8 a month one. And basically, let me log in to show you how it works. So if you have like a customer testimonial or things like that, or like a training, like I have this video right here, what I'm going to do is just upload that file. You could do from Google Drive to any of those. You can give it a title. Let's do Facebook training 14 and then choose if it was shot horizontally or vertically. So you can do it directly from your phone. So it will take a second to actually load and get it ready. Close to 80% of people on Facebook are watching without sound. So you really need subtitles below the video. You can either have them so they're permanently a part of it or within the Facebook ad, you can actually punch in the subtitles. Those are two different options. So what this program does, you can absolutely do in any other editing app or Final Cut Pro. It just does it very quickly and automatically. And I also like that it's an online platform because like I edit in Final Cut Pro, but if I'm trying to get people to help me who don't use Final Cut Pro, it can be really challenging to like share projects and files and make sure they know what they're doing. Whereas with this one, you can just give someone a log into the account and they can just go in and make small adjustments and then export it and send you the finished file. Okay, so that took a couple minutes, but now the titles are ready for design. And you have all the different size formats. It tells you what's best for each one. So we'll do a square video first. Um, and I already created a template so I can use it at any point in the future. So you just change out the headline or you can have someone else do it and just tell them what the headline is, change the font and color and stuff like that. Uh, for social media posts, sometimes it's nice where people can see how much time is remaining in the ad. So you have that option. Uh, you can also put logo and stuff like that. But the coolest part is you can see it automatically generated closed captions that go along with it and timed it out and burned it into the bottom and you can adjust the size and stuff like that. So if you have someone speaking, this is super duper cool. It's not perfect. I usually spend maybe two minutes uh, going in and double checking that everything looks right. But you know, to do these by hand and like Final Cut, which is a pro program, takes you know 30 minutes sometimes, especially if it's a several minute video. So that is a huge time saver. You can create some like titles and stuff like that in iMovie or anything like that. Uh, it'll just take a little longer to do the subtitles. You can also use a program like otter.ai or Happy Scribe or Rev, and that will generate like the subtitles and you can actually upload those on Facebook and they'll just uh, appear on Facebook. So that's another option for you as well. All right, so I'm going to download it and boom. In terms of video editors, iMovie, Windows Movie Maker, and DaVinci Resolve are all free. DaVinci Resolve is actually pro level, but it has kind of a steep learning curve. And then in the pro level, there's Final Cut Pro and Premiere are the two most common. The other tool that I like using is called Glorify. It's very similar to something like Canva. They do have a free trial, and then it's about $10 a month if you want unlimited access to everything. So very similar to Canva, but it has an awesome background cutout tool and it's really designed entirely around e-commerce. Let's say we want to do a square photo. You can look up like by most popular and then, you know, just find something that works really well. And then you can just punch in your own photo and you know, everything is completely editable. Uh, the nice thing is they sometimes have like packs and things like that. So you can find other similar templates. So you can see there's a whole bunch of other designs. I like the smart resize. It makes it pretty easy to do, let's say 1080 by 1920. You still have to do some work, but you can see it pretty quickly readjusted that. Um, so it's now in the story format, which we'll definitely want so you can like remove the images and change out the fonts, give the text 
whatever name you want. And let's see, I've got my uploads. So we can just put that <laughs> waffle in there. With photos, generally you want some sort of text, some bright colors. You can do like a bright outline around the edges, like a red bar or something like that. Um, occasionally you can actually make it work where it has no text, where it kind of like blends in with the timeline a little bit and just looks like they're seeing a photo from someone else. So it doesn't scream add to them. Usually that works best if it's a photo that's just like every day, like it was just taken with someone's phone um, where people kind of get sucked in, especially with food or something like that. You do actually have access to a lot of free photos. So like we have this woman eating the watermelon. Let me show you how cool the background remover tool is. Wow, yeah, that's crazy. So it cut all of that out really, really well. Um, maybe I'll cut out the watermelon itself. So you just like paint around what stays in. Okay, so I'm gonna click done. So you can definitely do this with Photoshop. It's just a lot faster here. One quick tip, any program you're working in, you know, this looks huge or face looks giant, but you have to think about people are going to see this, you know, <laughs> like that big. If it's in the sidebar, it may even be like that big. So I always look at it at different sizes when I'm doing it. You always wanna think about having some high level of saturation for stuff, like something pop, you know, you have to stay within your brand guidelines. But you can see, uh, for an example, it's pretty quick to create that. I'ma click download. You can also do a transparent image if you wanted a photo like just of a woman. So I'm gonna do high res JPEG. When I'm running ads, we're usually doing like 20, 30, 50, 100 different ads per month. The thing is you don't have to do a brand new redesign on each one. What you can do is like change out this text, even try it with no text, change out the photo. So I could easily turn this into four variations, five variations. Uh, let me switch out the text to gluten free and save that. There are two free photo editing options. The first is a program called GIMP. It's very similar to Photoshop where you can do a whole bunch with like crazy layers and cutouts and tools and things like that. And then Canva is very similar to the Glorify app. Um, it's a little less e-commerce focused, but it's really cool, really well featured. A lot of people create ads in both of those programs too. I'm gonna really quickly find one last design. You wanna act like you're scrolling through Facebook and see what really jumps out at you. And you don't have to always have text. Uh, it usually works fairly well. Let's see, that one jumped out at me. Facebook generally wants you to use a little bit less text. They used to have a rule that was really hard and fast that you could only have 20% of the image be text. They've backed off from that a little bit, but it's still not a bad practice to have it be around 20%. All right, so we've got this other image. This one we can use like the text and the headline and the stuff that goes with it to do the selling. You don't need to do like a crazy amount within this. Now you should have your ads. Let me give you some bonus tips. People love smiling faces or people that are actually showing emotion or actually enjoying things. People also love like babies and puppies. Those tend to gain a whole lot of attention and a whole lot of likes. You wanna do square as well as story. So I would recommend doing like 1080 by 1080 
and 1080 by 1920 or something similar to that. So it's actually high res and looks really good. You wanna do a variety of ads, but that can be as simple as switching out a headline or changing out the photo or swapping out the color or things like that. If I'm doing a campaign and say, wow, this ad did amazingly well, I'll start testing different variations with different like headlines and things like that. Again, here are the three programs that I think are really amazing and I recommend. And then here are some free alternatives that'll help you create these ads from start to finish. If you have any questions on what to create, leave a comment down below. I am itching to jump into Facebook Ads Manager. The final thing we need to do is finalize our like text and headlines and things like that because when we get into Facebook, we'll need to actually drop those in. Now I'm gonna share this spreadsheet with you. you. Organizing things like this is gonna make it so much easier to see what's working, to actually test things. Uh, Maxwell Finn, who has like the best Facebook ads course ever introduced this concept to me. So let's look real quick. So a Facebook ad, you have the primary text, which is up here. Um, and then obviously the video, then you have the call to action and the link, which usually is just the main link. You can put in a custom thing. And then this is the headline. And then the description is down below. If the headline's a little longer, sometimes the description doesn't show, um, but they show up differently in different placements. So like sometimes on stories, it'll show like description or things like that. You wanna go back to this thing which has, you know, the rough draft of different headlines or bits of text, uh, some stories you could work in, uh, some different audiences that you could speak to, as well as every reason someone would buy, every reason someone wouldn't buy, go back to that section if you haven't covered it yet. Um, and, you know, we're thinking, okay, we're gonna spend like $1,500 aiming for more than 30 sales. So, I would say, you know, it's not an exact science, but I would probably try to test uh, two to four of each. So like two to four headlines. So primary text, I think this is probably the most important because uh, it's the first thing people see. It can be a lot longer. So I'll share this spreadsheet with you so you can have access. You, you wanna go to file and then make a copy. And this will allow you to punch in all your own primary text and headlines and creative for your ad account. Obviously I spend a whole lot longer if I was doing it for a customer or client, but this utilizes some of the copywriting things that we talked about. Uh, so using like a customer quote, uh, showing how many people like it, building some curiosity, uh, emphasizing how many people have left positive reviews, uh, highlighting the main reason that people buy it. So the idea is later on, you can go through and see all your ads and see all your ads that include D3, so you can know if having free shipping in the description works. And some of these you can switch out, you know, you can have free shipping as a headline or things like that. They don't have to be entirely different. And then the different ads I created, um, I have tagged them. So this is creative uh, photo 01 and then creative video 01. So this is an amazing guide to kind of look through your ads and see what's working the best. And you can use some tools, like I use Supermetrics, it's a little bit expensive, but I can actually see for like every ad I've ever launched, um, the exact number of purchases across like 900 ads. Uh, I can see the performance of every single headline of all time that we've ever launched. So just that level of data. And you can also do for all time, weekly, things like that. So that's pretty insane. And that's why you wanna set it up like this today. And it'll just make it simpler and easier and more organized, even if you're not using a fancy tool. So you can see when we actually launch things in this format, it makes it so much simpler to see exactly what we're launching and what it contains. So you could quickly see how are the ones that have the first heading doing. You can also search, so you can do like ad name contains H01. We can even include other filters like campaign name includes cold and see how ads with that headline are doing with cold traffic. So this would allow us to see the performance of cold traffic campaigns, which have an ad that contains heading 01. 
I'm so excited to jump into Facebook Ads Manager. If you jump to this point in the video, I wanna say that everything that came before is actually a lot more important. Like the exact words you're using and the exact ads that you create and knowing your audience is much more important than how you're structuring your campaigns or how you're setting those things up. But let's get into ads. Everyone has their own way of running Facebook ads. I'm gonna show you what's worked incredibly well for me, and I'm always running tests and trying to improve and increase profitability for me and my customers. I created this tutorial where you can follow along step by step, so I'm only including the types of ads and audiences that just about everyone can use. So let's talk about the three different campaigns that we're going to create and the way we're going to structure them. So the very first one is going to be to brand new people who have not heard of us before. And we're just going to do a very, very broad audience and take our four ads and show it to everyone in the audience. And throughout the day, I have this representing how much is spending on each ad. So it'll start off spending pretty equally between ads. But as we're getting sales or leads or things like that throughout the day, it'll start diverting more and more spend to the thing that's generating sales and the thing that's working. So you can see in this one, it didn't actually generate any sales. So it really stopped spending money on that ad and put that money toward this one. So if it was $100 for the day, you know, this one would have got nearly half of our spend and this one would have got uh, just 10% or something like that, even though it's one out of four ads. So our second campaign is also to cold traffic, also to brand new audiences. And this one's based off interests. So I'll get into setting them up exactly, but we're doing like fitness and wellness, protein bars, yoga, and we're using the same four ads to reach new people. So this way we can kind of see, oh, ad three worked really, really well with this audience. But since we have the same ads across the campaigns, we can really put enough spend into them to know whether they worked or not. And we can also say, oh man, ad four worked really, really well across all audiences. We can kind of check that off as one of our best ads that we can use over and over going forward. We also have like a video, which is going to be important for retargeting because when we do our warm and hot audiences, we're gonna say, okay, people who watch 50% of this video get added to that warm audience. The warm audience is like people who are familiar with us or visited a page or engaged on Facebook or things like that. And it's actually gonna go through the same thing in each audience and ad set where it diverts the spend to what's working really, really well. So this will happen across all three campaigns. So our third and final audience is warm and hot traffic. So these are people who are already familiar with us, with our product, and we're just trying to get them to complete their purchase. So often with bigger campaigns, I will do a separate warm and hot audience campaigns. But for this one, we have hot audience, people who have visited the website and spent a decent amount of time on the page. If we had lower traffic, I'd probably just do all website visitors. But this one will say there's a decent amount of traffic. We're doing people who spent a lot of time in the last 30 days, in the last 31 to 180 days and then people who visited a very specific page. So we have our top seller in this example is peanut butter protein waffles. So people who land on that page, we're showing them very specific ads that try to get them back on that page to finish. And these are different ads from our cold traffic campaigns, just so there's some variety and we're really adding people from our cold traffic to our warm traffic when they're watching videos and engaging with ads. So now they'll be able to see a variety of different ads and not get burned out seeing the same thing over and over. And these are also a little more customized toward people who are already familiar with our brand, trying to kind of push them over the edge to actually make a purchase. Do you wanna become really good at Facebook ads? I actually created a completely free 18 day course. You get an email every day with a new lesson. The link to that is down below. And a lot of the lessons are from my YouTube channel, but include extra commentary and resources and PDFs and guides. And there's actually three videos that are not available anywhere else but in that course. So that's the only place you can find them. The link again to that is down below. Jumping back over to Facebook, I'm gonna click Create to start setting up the campaign. You definitely need a Facebook Pixel properly set up before going 
any further, I'll have a card pop up up top. Uh, you, you can watch that video and come right back here because if you don't have it set up, it's not gonna be able to track your purchases. So it can't actually optimize to showing it to the right people. You'll have no idea if your ads are working correctly. So that video covers everything on installing a Facebook Pixel. So as soon as you open up, you have a lot of campaign objectives, brand awareness, reach, traffic, engagement, app install. 95% of the time I optimize for conversions because that is what I want people to do. I want them to actually buy. So even if I have like a training video or something or send them to a informational article where I just want people to click the link and go to that page, you'd think, oh, you're gonna use like traffic or video views for that. Not always because I wanted to target people who are the most likely to buy because what's the reason I'm showing them a training video or what's the reason I'm sending traffic to an information page because I wanna follow up with them and then I want them to buy. Even if I'm getting them on an email list and sending a series of emails and then pitching them a product, I want it to specifically find people who are more likely to spend money. I just know so many people who've built up leads or things like this where uh, all of these things, they're just doing traffic and it is actively looking for people who are cheap traffic but are not going to buy and it just converts horribly. So if you're doing lead generation, I generally recommend that you use conversions because that is for tracking leads and purchases on your website. Lead generation here is collecting leads through Facebook and while they're really inexpensive, I've also found them to be fairly low quality. So previewing what we'll do in the next step under conversion event, we can select purchase, but we can also select an event like lead as well. I'll show you how I have things set up on my website. Here's that 18 day ads course. So I am tracking view content specifically for people who hit this page. And then once they enter in their email, it will take them to a thank you page and as soon as they reach this page, it is tracking them as a lead. I do wanna say that campaign objective is a lot more important if you have a huge audience because it's gonna look through that giant audience and try to find the people who are most likely to make a purchase. So it's not gonna show it to the vast majority. If you have a relatively small audience like website visitors, it's really gonna just show it to every single person in that audience. So it's not going to need to pick and choose who to show it to based off that campaign objective. So when we do our warm and hot traffic campaign later, we can either do purchases or impressions because at that point, the goal is just to get it in front of every person in that audience. I haven't found it makes a big difference. So we're just gonna stick with purchases when we set that up. You can put a total spending limit. I generally only do this, let's say if it's like a uh, weekend promotion or something like that. And it's like, hey, we have 600 marketing dollars to put toward this weekend sale. You can do that there. A, B, test. Um, this can be good to split test, but I actually do the split testing in Ads Manager, so I always ignore A, B, test. Campaign budget optimization. So it says campaign budget will distribute your budget across ad sets to get better results. So you can turn that on or off. I will generally turn it on. You know, I have hundreds of thousands of dollars of data and I've found that my CBO campaigns tend to do better. I'll be explaining a few concepts with custom graphics. So just leave your setup where it's at and I'll jump right back in in a second. So what is ABO versus CBO? So ABO is ad budget optimization and CBO is campaign budget optimization. So you have the overall budget for your campaign. Let's say this time it's $100 per day. With ABO, you'll actually select how much money each of these audiences and ad sets is going to get. So you can set them at whatever you want. And this example will say, hey, I want you to split them equally. So each one gets equal spend. And if you remember, the ones that perform best and generate the most sales get the most spend. So in this example, we set it at 100. It's spending equally amongst all these three. And this one gets $17 because it did really well. Now look at campaign budget optimization. So 
rather than you selecting the budget for each audience or ad set individually, it's kind of going to do the same thing where it says, okay, this audience is doing really, really well. I'm going to divert more and more of that hundred dollars toward this one because it's generating the most sales. In this example, it diverted half the spend to this one because it did better. And then half of that spend to the top performing ad. So this one ad got a quarter of our spend. And then, you know, the worst performing one here may get like $3 or $4 of spend. So when I use ABO, it's normally when I have a really small audience and I just want a little bit more control over how much I'm putting toward that audience and how often people see it. You know, if this is a really small audience, let's say it's 400 people in this example, you know, it'll cost $8 to reach the full audience. You know, I can be reaching people several times if I'm spending $3 a day. Well, if I'm just leaving it up to CBO and it's kind of splitting it to what's doing best, you know, this is a really good audience. It's small, but it's amazing. And I just wouldn't want it to start spending like $10 a day on this one because then that would just mean it shows it to people over and over and over. So I actually know how big of an audience size I have. It's very, very small. And I know how many times I want the audience to see it. And that's why I'm going to use ABO and actually set the budget individually so that each of these, it shows an ad to people in these audience, maybe like three, four, five times a week. Let's jump back into Facebook. So we've got CBO turned on. So then we can choose the daily budget. So this is for the full campaign. So with this, we've got, you know, 1500 to spend over a week or so. So we have our three total campaigns. I'm going to probably spend a pretty equal amount with each campaign. You'll remember that we talked through this strategy earlier in the video. Here's the time code if you need to go back for review. Yeah, let me do $75 a day for this campaign and we'll set that for the various campaigns. Campaign bid strategy. So let's talk the different bid strategies. The default and definitely the simplest and easiest is lowest cost. And that's what we're gonna use here, but you definitely want to know about the other types of bids and things like that. Not only so you can use it in the future, but also this is gonna teach you a lot about how the Facebook ad platform works. So there's constant auctions going on, you know, people who are less expensive to get in front of or are pretty likely to make a purchase uh, without spending a whole lot of money. So let's say your budget for the day is like $150. So it's going to kind of work its way through the cheaper auctions until it's hit like $150. So it's definitely going to spend right around 150, enter these auctions. And since your spend is a little low, it's going to ignore these up here. Whereas if your budget's like $1,000 a day, it has to show it to every single person in this audience to hit your spend. And that's often why it'll cost a little more when you're spending a whole lot. You know, some of those people may be really competitive to get in front of or to get to buy. But next up we have target costs. I don't really use this one a whole lot, but now we're getting into manual bids where you're actually going to set an exact amount that you're going to bid. So usually I run lowest cost first and get some idea of what I'm getting purchases for. So saying, okay, I'm pretty consistently getting them for $25. So that's going to be the target. That's where I'm profitable. So you're going to set that bid at, let's say $25, $24, something like that. Target cost is going to really try to be like exactly acquiring a customer for $25. So it's going to bid right at 25 and then go down to like 20 and then up to 30. So I haven't used target cost in years. I just haven't found the results quite as good. And I think the other manual bids are quite a bit better. Okay, next up we have bid cap. So we're gonna set the exact amount that we're willing to bid. In this example, again, we'll say it's right at $25. It could be anything. And in this example, we're actually not going to bid on any auctions that are more expensive than that, even a little bit more expensive. So it'll be right at 25. So none of these auctions above this, it's going to enter. So the benefit of this is you can really control how much you're able to pay to acquire a customer. The downside is sometimes it's very, very low volume or very, very low spend for the day. You know, it's not actually that uncommon where there's just none of the cheap auctions at all and you spend zero dollars for the day. Okay, so then my favorite is cost cap. And so you're setting the manual bid 
and it's going to try to kind of average you know if you set it at 25 it's going to try to get you purchases for 25 or less and mostly exists under here but it can kind of reach up into a little bit more expensive options you know if it says oh this is a really good person to show it to i can still keep your average amount really good so this is kind of the best of both worlds where you're actually hitting a little bit more of your spend and reaching a little bit above when it makes sense, but you're still keeping things very, very manageable. Okay, so let's look at, so that was a day that's kind of moderately competitive. Here's a day that's really good where there's a lot of cheap auctions to enter. So under lowest cost, suddenly, you know, you could spend your whole $150 and not have to go into more expensive ones. So your average amount you're getting per customer for the day is gonna be really good. It's gonna be a really good day for you. That's on the lower spend. And then let's say you're at a lot higher, like $500 a day, you're not actually having to go to the very top because there's all these more affordable options that you can choose. And under this day for target cost, you can reach your full spend. There's a lot of different options for you to enter. For bid cap, you probably can reach a decent amount of spend um, and actually hit that because there's a lot of cheap auctions for it to enter. And then, you know, you have even more auctions and it can hit even more spend with cost cap. But what happens if you have just an extremely competitive day where it's really expensive to get in front of people? Well, if you're under lowest cost, it's going to, you know, have to spend your full budget. So it's going to start here and kind of work its way up. And the average amount you're spending for a purchase is going to be, you know, way up in the $35, $40. So you'll spend the full amount, but not get very good results. If you do target cost, you know, it can reach up here a little bit, but you're not going to get a lot of spend for the day. And, you know, you have very limited bid cap. You'll get probably like $2 of spend for the day because you can only show it to a couple people right here and it's not able to reach up into any of these auctions to try to get results. And then under cost cap, it can reach up a little bit into some of these auctions that are happening around here, but you're probably not going to hit your spend for the day. So here is kind of how things on average look over time. So this is lowest cost, where you're gonna be spending the same amount every single day, no matter how competitive the market is. So your results, like your cost per purchase, if it's really high, that's bad. If it's low, that's really, really great. So it's really gonna fluctuate the kind of results that you're getting as the market is changing. Whereas if you're bidding manually, like with cost cap, and you set it at $20, it will fluctuate definitely, but you're gonna be relatively close to getting purchases for $20. But on days where it's super competitive, you're gonna hit maybe nothing in spend. And then days where you can get purchases really good, there's those low auctions to enter, then you're actually gonna hit the full amount of spend. So you could say, okay, I'm willing to spend $200. Whereas most days you're only gonna hit a fraction of that because it's basically just picking off the uncompetitive uh, auctions and kind of working its way up to $20 and then it has to stop. So I actually like running both of these at the same time because then you know I'm getting consistent sales with varying results, but then on really competitive days, you know I'm not losing money on the cost cap. And then on really good days, it's actually going to hit its spend where I can generate twice as many sales on those days. And actually I use automations so that my spend for the day, I'm actually based off results, scaling it up or scaling it down. So my spending looks a little bit more like this. Whereas if there's a bad day, I'm gonna start pausing things or turning down spend. And if it's a really good day, I will boost the spend and spend a lot more. And then I also have costs kept going at the same time. So on this day, we get a crazy amount of sales because it's super uncompetitive. We can get amazing deals like getting purchases. Whereas on this day where the purchases were terrible, you know, I'm not spending any here and I've really turned down the spend here. So I'm not actually losing that much money. Continuing on on Facebook, we're going to choose lowest cost. Leave me a comment if you want me to do a future video on running a bid test where we test bid amounts. So as scheduling, you can only do this with a lifetime budget. You can't do like every day. Uh, normally you don't need to schedule things. It would be like if there's a specific promotion that could be useful. 
Um, occasionally, like if you just could not answer phone calls over the weekend or things like that, you could use ad scheduling, but I really try to run them all the time. Okay, so now that we have all this, I'm going to properly name our campaign. So I'm gonna do cold, which means brand new people who haven't heard of us. Um, conversion, so I'll do website conversions. I'll put that at the end. These lines just help keep it clean. I'm gonna kind of name like the grouping of the campaign. So I'm gonna do, let's say, interests. Then I also want to put lowest cost and CBO. And then I just find it helpful to do the date that I launched it. <laughs> All right, so now we have that campaign. Let's move on. Okay, so ad set, we'll name it after we choose the different selections. So website, you wanna choose your pixel. Make sure you choose the right one and you'll choose purchase. Um, it'll show green if you're actually already getting a lot. Um, if you aren't currently getting a whole bunch or aren't running ads, it'll likely show up as red. So dynamic creative, should you use it? It's pretty cool for testing. I used to use it a lot and I don't really use it anymore and I'll explain why. So basically what dynamic creative is, it takes uh, a whole bunch of photos. You can put in photos, headlines, description, primary text, all these different things. And it'll kind of rapidly test it with different people. So it'll say, oh, let me show this photo and this headline and this description to this person. Uh, so you can kind of drill down and zero in on what's performing the best. Uh, the reason I don't like it as much anymore is once you have like a whole bunch of campaigns, you kind of have to drill down into each campaign and it's hard to see like the overall results for different ads. Um, it's not anywhere close to like that big old spreadsheet where you see absolutely everything. So it just became unwieldy to try to figure out across the board what was doing well. And the other big thing is, so you can keep some of the existing like comments and likes and things like that. But let's say if I just do it as a regular ad, I can then launch a new campaign and then use the existing post. And then that campaign will immediately have all of the likes, all of the comments, all of the shares, which, which actually can, have a make a really big difference, especially when they're really positive comments. Uh, you know, we talked about social proof with copywriting. You know, if people can go through and just read all this response and stuff like that, um, that actually does a big job selling it for you. So you can't really keep that in the same way with dynamic creative. So that's why I've moved away. Uh, if you want to test it out, it works pretty well. But I think just manually punching it in. I find works better. Later on in the tutorial, I'll show you how to set up use existing posts. It's an incredibly important skill to have, even if we're not going to use it in setting up this campaign. Um, start date, generally you want it to start immediately. You don't have to worry too much about like timing for the day or things like that. Like certain times of day do a little better, but nothing that's worth like altering this for, unless you have some reason. Uh, usually you won't have an end date. Um, and I don't do ad spend limits. I just adjust each day. Um, audience. So we've got, you can create a new audience, use a saved audience. You can kind of build these over time. Uh, the custom audiences are like people who've already interacted with your business. So on this one, we'll do reaching brand new people. But when we set up like the warm and hot traffic, we're actually going to want to set them off up based off, you know, video views, Instagram, website, all that fun stuff. Let me tell you a little bit about lookalikes because those are actually some of the most profitable audiences that I have. So lookalikes is showing it to brand new people, but it's finding the, let's say 1% of people who are the most like your current customers or current page visitors. I generally recommend doing customer or lead. So you actually are gonna, you know, select the pixel uh, based off purchased. I generally, yeah, just highest value, uh, United States. So basically it's gonna look through all 240 million people and is gonna find the 1% that are most similar to your existing audience. So the audience size is 
2.4 million people, you know, 1% of the US. You can actually do, so if you do like 10%, that'll be 24 million people. It's okay, here's the 10% that look best. So I found 1% performs really well. 10% uh, can do pretty good. Again, pe Facebook kind of has its pick amongst people. Um, so sometimes larger audience sizes are not bad. You can create a number of them. I usually just do one at a time, uh, do it custom. So can you do a lookalike audience if you have like a brand new pixel or brand new ad account and don't have any data to pull from because you know it's trying to find preferably thousands of people who are purchasers and then create these audience based off that. Well, what you can do is if you have like a list of your customer files, you can actually upload a customer list of all your customers. And as much of these as you can give Facebook, the more likely it is to kind of match people and do a really good job. Uh, you can even put like the customer value, like how many purchases they made and things like that. But any of them you can. I can do a full tutorial on like uploading that and posting it. Even if you do have a lot of purchases and a pixel and things like that, if you do have a separate customer list, it's definitely worth including. So this will kind of walk you through the steps for creating that because uh, lookalikes are awesome. So this is the point that you actually upload it. So that's a cold audience that is really, really good. So for this one, we're just gonna do based off like location and age. So location, if you can do the whole country, that is definitely ideal because your cost will just be a lot lower. It'll be a lot less expensive to get in front of people and you can enter a lot of those uh, affordable auctions. Um, age range, okay, so I'm pretending like we're selling protein waffles that applies to quite a few people. The, the interesting thing with Facebook ads is Facebook really likes when it has a lot of different customers and, and data to pull from. Like we had one where we knew that 75% of their customers were young women. That was mostly that. It was like 20% men, 80% women who bought, and then mostly younger people that bought. Uh, so we said, okay, let's just show it to young women. It'll do better. It actually did worse. Now we'll, let's just show it to women, did worse. Let's just show it to young people, did worse. I'm not sure exactly what the Facebook algorithm or things like that, but still to this day, the you know men and women 18 to 65 outperforms just targeting one. That's kind of a difference with Facebook. If you're marketing and like sending out mailers and things like that, uh, you'd want to only show it to young women because it costs money to get in front of each people. Whereas Facebook's like taking an audience of millions of people and picking you know 10,000 people to show it to, the very, very best. So it's a little different. Uh, so for this, yeah, it's protein waffles, all genders. Then there is detailed targeting. So this is where you get into all the demographics, all the interests, all the behaviors. Um, so in terms of audience size, I usually like when it's um, several million, maybe 10 million. Um, Generally, if it's a smaller audience, uh, you can add it in with other ones. So like, let's say Lutheran church, this does not apply to uh, waffles, but like, okay, independent evangelical Lutheran church. Okay, so if you're targeting that group, that'd be a good audience. You just want to include it with, you know, several other audiences, but you know, that could be a good one to target if that's what you're focusing on. Okay, so for the protein waffle example, let's just do fitness, you know, people who are really health conscious into that. Uh, so 800 million people are into fitness. So that's probably a little big. That's worldwide, so it'd be smaller in the US. But let's see, I'm trying to think of something that captures like the fitness and, yeah, we could do like weight loss, like fitness and wellness. Um, you're not always going to get an exact potential reach number, especially if you do like custom audiences and stuff like that. Uh, so it's pretty broad, but you know, I think that's a good size. We could probably just stick with that one. So you can narrow the audience by saying, okay, they need to like fitness, but they also need to like Teletubbies. We know our customers really well. They're obsessed with Teletubbies. 
So now it's down to 7,000 people. E even though a decent number liked it, there's just a lot less overlap. Uh, so you can narrow it down if you want to, but I'm not afraid of audiences that have millions of people, uh, cause then you can really like scale them and show them to a large percentage of the people in that audience because you know, 10 million people, uh, if you spend a whole lot on that audience, you go from showing it to uh, 0.1% to 1%. Uh, it, there's less great people to show it to once you've shown it to like 30%, 40%, 50%. Connections, I don't really touch that. That's like warm traffic, which I just do under the custom audiences. Auto placements. Uh, so this is where your ad is shown. So you can see manual placement. You could put it like newsfeed, desktop, marketplace. I've just found auto placement just does quite a bit better on average, like 30, 40%. Um, so I just leave it at auto placements and set up all those placements. Conversion window. So you show an ad one day and a bunch of people see it and then they click on it and you're actually setting, okay, so if someone clicks on your ad and then four days later, they go and make a purchase. If you're on seven day click, one day view, it will then attribute that purchase to the ad on that, that day. So it can attribute purchases from several days prior for seven days prior. So that's usually a good default. I often leave it on that. Um, it kind of depends on the price point. If something's really like an impulse buy, if you do a conversion window, that's like one day click, which is the hardest to hit, then it's really going to try to optimize for people who just see it and make a purchase right away. Um, so sometimes impulse things, I, you know, do one day click, but usually the default seven day click one day view works pretty well, especially um, if you have something where you kind of follow up with people or show them an article or things like that. I want to have that seven day window and you get charged as soon as people see it. Okay, so let's go and name this thing. Okay, so I'm going to call this audience fitness and wellness actually need to add that to the spreadsheet so we can track it a little later. So fitness and wellness, I'll call this interests zero one. And then I'll include, um, it was like weight loss, fitness, wellness. That was like the best description of what it was. If it was multiple things, I put a comma so I know exactly what I was targeting on it. Then I will do 18 to 65 plus. And then if it was something like Instagram viewers, 30 days, I would do like 30 days, but that doesn't apply here. And then AP automatic placements. And then seven day click one day view. And if it was like one day click, it would just be one DC instead of that. Awesome. So I know it's a bit of a pain naming it, but trust me, that is gonna make things so much better, easier to understand. All right, now we can actually create the ad. So we'll wait to name it until we punch everything in. But okay, you, we can choose the page. We can choose the Instagram account. All right, add setup. So you have your options. You've got single image, carousel, collection. Now the bread and butter is definitely image and video. Um, usually like carousels, I will start testing that once I find some good images and videos, then I can like put them all together into a carousel or things like that. But getting started first campaign, I think you could just test images and video. That's, you know, been 90 something percent of sales. Uh, you can skip over both of these. All right, and then we are going to add the media. Uh, let's do the image. You can also set up a Facebook catalog, which can kind of dynamically display products of pages people have visited. It's better for warm and hot traffic. Um, I will be doing a tutorial on that, but 
you know, photos, videos, you know, like I said, bread and butter. Um, that's what makes the most money. So I'm gonna upload the, from the images I created earlier. Now we are going to upload the photo. So we can do this one first. <laughs> Don't copy these, these were done quickly, but I did build a full made up campaign just for you and this tutorial. Okay, so square, that'll work well. It'll take a second to process. The exact resolution is less important. I tried to make it at least 1080 by 1080, but you know, it's no problem if it's a little bigger. So you can make a third version for the horizontal. They're not used in that many things. Usually I'll just either crop them or if I can't get it to work. So you, you can either uh, just have room on the sides or sometimes I'll just, you know, zoom in on that and have it mainly be the pancake. I feel like that's the least important one. And then for this one, I can change it for the story and actually choose the story version. And don't drag it directly. You have to click upload. It's kind of annoying. Okay, cool. So we have these three different sizes. Photos are a little quicker doing this. So you can see a little preview. And since we set up those three, it should look good on all of them, but you just kind of want to double check, look it over. You do have the option to turn a photo into a video. Basically, it just makes it a slideshow and zooms in on it a little bit. I don't really use this. I generally just custom design photos and videos separately. It's so now primary text. So we can think about what's going to work well with it. Um, let's see, so gluten-free is what we're promoting. So do you wanna eat healthier, but don't have time? I'm gonna copy that. Paste that. Headline, these are optional, but I would highly recommend them. I'm gonna switch back to previewing the desktop because that's the most important. All right, so let me look at, let's see. So I feel like these are a little redundant together. Okay, we're doing promoting health. We could do over 1 million sold. That's also probably short enough that we get a description as well. So I usually try to make the headline a little shorter. And then let's do 12 grams of protein. We wouldn't want to do gluten-free because we mentioned it already. Okay, so then punch in the website URL. This would be to, let's say, a waffle page. But for this example, we'll just use the website. Okay, so now we actually see what it should look like. Do you wanna eat healthier but don't have time? Gluten-free, over 1 million sold, 12 grams of protein. Uh, maybe I'll add a little more context. I will just add a little bit of extra social proof. Okay, so I made it a little longer. This will also show you if it's a little longer. Um, it may say see more. If it was a tiny bit longer, people would have to click to see more. That's actually not a terrible thing. If people are really engaged, uh, they will click that. So URL parameters, I won't cover this too much, but basically you can add things to the link that help with tracking later. It's not essential. I do that just to get a little more data, but it's really, not that key, it's a little complex to actually set up the tracking. And then, okay, you have all these different options. Typically for making a sale, I have been finding Shop Now has been performing a little bit better, uh, but if it was like an article or a training or a video, I definitely do learn more. So let's do Shop Now. Um, if it's a, in a different language, you can translate it, but if it's just the default, then that is fine. The final thing to do is actually to give it a name with the different things that we chose. So, okay, it is waffles, let's say it's waffles yellow background. So we'll give it that name. 
that's the name of the creative. The code for the creative is creative photo 01. We use the first text. You don't need to include it, but just so we know that we use that primary text. Okay, so the title I gave it, Waffles with the yellow background. Uh, the name of it is CRP01, the creative photo, uh, primary text one, headline one, description one, uh, shop now. And then I'm sending people to the home page uh, so I can track the different pages I send people to. This could be article one or like a specific product like protein or things like that. So you wanna make sure it says all edits saved, but then we can click close. We're gonna publish everything together at the very end of the video. Things are really well organized, cold interests. We have this ad set and then we have this ad. So we're about to duplicate the ad, but I do wanna cover how all of duplication works across Facebook ads. So you can actually duplicate a campaign or an ad set or an ad. So under the new campaign, you just hit duplicate and you can make a number of copies and that'll duplicate the entire campaign. Under the ad set, if you duplicate, this is what we're gonna be doing a lot where we have all the ads and just want it to go to a new audience. So you can duplicate it within that campaign. It'll make another copy and then we can edit that audience, but keep all of the ads the same. But you can also choose existing campaign where we take this ad set and move it into another campaign. And it's very similar on the ad level. So for the ad itself, if you just duplicate and leave it the same, it'll just make another ad here that's under the same audience. But you can also choose to move it to like a different campaign and ad set. Um, but if we switch out the campaign, we could do like cold interests. So we're moving it to that campaign and then we can actually choose to move it to that exact ad set. So you can choose precisely where the duplicate goes. It can go into any campaign. Continuing on with the tutorial, you'll want to duplicate your ad to make a copy. You'll want to leave it as original campaign. Okay, so now we can use some of the other photos, some of the other content that we created. So we'll rename it in a minute. I'm just gonna clear all the media. And then you can add a new one. So hit upload, it's super annoying. It doesn't work if you just drag it. I probably should have named these, but I didn't, so let's live with it. All right, so this one's very simple, but we are testing. Okay, what happens if we have this other photo? So you, okay, that's good on the crop. Um, this one we can, this one actually looks good like that. Apply. And then we can change out for our story version. If you didn't hear it earlier, you wanna leave some space because they'll often put like buttons and call to actions down here. Okay, done. So I'm actually going to leave the primary text headline description the same for this one, because I'm really testing in this case, which waffle with this photo people like better. So it's actually, a good thing to leave these the same because then I know, oh man, it wasn't that this one had a good headline and the other one is mainly just, hey, okay, which photo do people like better? So I can leave the title the same, except for, uh, we could say, waffles picture two. You can even like make a Google link so you can link to the photos themselves. CRP05. Okay, so I'm gonna call a waffle picture two, CRP05. Zero five. Zero five. 
I'm going to keep it in draft again. When you duplicate it, you can do several different copies, um, but I usually do one at a time just to keep it simple. So I'm going to test four of the ads that we created with this audience. And I'll probably do the same four ads to the second cold audience. So I can kind of see those two audiences compared against one another. And that way those four ads, we can kind of actually put some money behind them and see how they're performing. So for this one, I am going to use the video that we created and we created a square version as well as a story version. So I'm just gonna clear everything that's in here and then go to add media and then add video. So those are in fact not pancakes, but since it's a fake campaign, we're gonna roll with it. All right, so you can't drag it directly. You have to go to upload and then I'll just drag it in there, choose open. It'll take a second to upload. And I usually start with the square version first, uploading that uh, because that has a lot more placements. While it's uploading, I am going to grab a new primary text. Learn why over 10,000 have left a five star review, dot, dot, dot. Okay, cool. We're done uploading. I'll just finish up the text. Uh, let's do free shipping for this one, for the headline. And then, yeah, we can leave it as gluten free. I'm just gonna change this headline while we're here. So this is creative video 01, waffles falling in. That'll be CRV01, and then I believe is headline two. All right, so now I am going to adjust these different placements and go through, it takes a second, but I do wanna make sure every single placement looks good. So this is a square video that's decent resolution. Uh, you can see we are not gonna crop it, but they recommend you do a one by one crop, so it's already perfect. Instead, we're gonna to go to thumbnail, and sometimes you can even create your own images to do as the thumbnail. Sometimes you can even do a photo that's performed really well. Um, but we can simply just find a decent shot. This one's pretty simple, so they're all fairly similar, but we'll do something where it's a little bit wider so we can save that thumbnail. So we have that placement. So I'll just go through each placement really quickly and set the thumbnail manually for each one at the start. That one's good, it's already one by one. So I'm gonna speed up customizing each side. You can see a preview of how it will look and you can also go to crop to see the recommended size. The right column needs to be an image so you can either leave that and it won't show or sometimes I'll even just pick one of our top performing and change it out for that. You'll need to, yeah, like that. I'm just gonna skip over the groups and go to stories. So we actually created a story version and that's ideal if you can actually create one specific to stories. It's not a huge deal, you know, that doesn't look too bad. It's not horrible to show that square video. You just have a little space at the top and the bottom, but it's definitely ideal if you have the time and resources to actually make a new version. So you can actually see, you know, we have our square video. I'm gonna swap this one out for our story version but you can actually create a cropped version of it. In this case, you know, it doesn't work. Sometimes you can actually do the crop within Facebook, but usually I just make another version. So I'd go to change and then we already uploaded the story version. So you see, we left just enough space for that call to action at the button. That's why you don't want text at the very, very bottom. We'll just change out the thumbnail. I actually like the close up better with that. And if you created captions, you can do like an SRT file and actually upload them, but we already have the text on our videos, which I think is a better way to do it. I'm gonna work on updating these other placements. So it takes a little while, but we have now customized all 16 placements, made sure that they all look great. 
We'll just look over it one more time. We already named it properly. All right, this one is done. I'm gonna make sure it's saved it to the draft and I'll hit close. So I'm going to duplicate this ad into the new campaign and repeat the exact same steps again. Okay, so now I'll go through the same process. All of these look good. I'll swap out some of the primary text, the headline description, make sure the website URL, and then rename everything. I think you get the picture. All right, so this is the total we're gonna test in this ad set. So it's gonna take the campaign budget and spread it across the ad sets and then spread it across these four ads at the fitness and wellness and weight loss market. So this ad set is done and we wanna get it done before we duplicate it and show it to a different audience. Um, and since we wanna test this audience versus the other one, I think it makes total sense to do an exact duplicate and leave everything else the same. We don't need to even have to name the new ads, anything different. We just need to name this something else. I will just do another interest. So I'm gonna select the next couple of audiences with you. So let's say Waffle is one um, interest. So Waffle House is actually an employer, which I don't know if it would be that helpful. Belgian Waffle. Um, you can target like a specific page like Ego or things like that. You could also think of a competitor. So even something like RX bar is like kind of a healthy bar or Lara bar. Um, even though they're not direct competitors, it's kind of like a healthy take on a certain thing. So that actually could be a decent interest. So that'd be, okay, 1.4 million people. So you could do that and one other things, kind of do like fitness bars, uh, protein bars, things like that. Uh, so those are some other things to target. We'll just do layer bar for this. So everything else is the same, but we will want to do like name it protein bar, bar, and then interest zero two. So we just change the name on that. Otherwise we can leave it the same. Then I'm going to duplicate. So we can say, let's do three interests that we're targeting. You can just do a direct duplicate. So I'm gonna look through the different yoga options and pick one that's kind of the audience size that I'm looking for and seems like a really good fit. So I do wanna show you, you can change the name of campaigns, ad sets, or ads in this setup screen, as well as when you're setting up the ad initially. So I'm gonna hit yoga and then click save to draft. So I think three is a good number for what we're testing. So this campaign is done. So we have cold based off interest, lowest cost, CBO. Then under it, we've got our three audiences and we're gonna show them the same ad so we can kind of see how those ads are performing. So the first campaign is done and we're about to jump into the second one. Really quickly, I wanna show you how you can use existing posts to keep all of the likes and comments in the future. After the campaigns you launched today have been running a while, you wanna take the top performing ads and launch them to new audiences, but with all the likes and comments saved. So this is gonna be how you're gonna do it. So, what you're gonna do is do use existing post. And then down below, you'll have the option to select a post. So you've got a couple of options. If you do select post, you'll actually see the different ones and you can select it directly or search for it or anything like that. But if you know a very specific ad, you can actually just go directly to that ad. So, okay, this is the one, it's got 42 likes on it. I wanna keep all of those. So I can do see post, Facebook posts with comments. 
And sometimes you can grab it directly from there. Sometimes it's kind of weird and has like add and stuff like that. So what you can do is actually go to embed and right there, it'll give you the exact post number. So now, you know, I'm using the existing post. When I click submit, I'm actually able to use that old, it can be an old ad or it can be an old post. Uh, you do have to keep everything the same, like the headline and things like that, but you do get to keep all of these. And if you take this ad, the one that's using the existing post and duplicate that, then that new ad is gonna keep every single comment and like and things like that. So you can actually keep an ad rolling out to more and more people. Some of them have like 3000 comments or something crazy and it's just a big, awesome conversation. So that's definitely highly recommended. So we'll need that skill in the future, but let's continue the tutorial and set up our second campaign. We're gonna do one more cold audience. So let's duplicate at the campaign level make one copy and most is going to be the same but i'm going to do broad so i'm going to do a really large audience and see how it performs for everyone who could be interested in waffles which is just about everyone everything else stays the same Okay, so I'm gonna go into this, and sometimes when it's in draft, it's kind of annoying. It shows some of the additional, like, ad sets, but these are the three that were are selected. And these two I can just delete. You wanna make sure you're deleting the right ones. So this is where you can like edit or duplicate, but if you choose those two, those duplicates, we wanna delete them because this campaign is just going to have the one all right, so everything else will be the same, except instead of protein bar, interest one, I'm just gonna do broad. 18 to 65, save to draft. Then I'll go in and edit. And okay, we have Lara bar interest. I'm gonna get rid of that and just show it to everyone, 220 million people. If you find it easier, you can just create a new campaign, but I'm doing it this way because then I can just use these four same ads again. Let's go in. So I'll just leave the ads the same. And now this one's ready to go. That was pretty quick. All right, so now we have both cold audiences done. This one's got three ad sets, three audiences, and this one just has the one broad audience. So it's up to you how you want to set it up. You know, we could have easily done four audiences here. We could have easily uh, done three and three, but I am trying to give some spend to those ads just so I can kind of see what headlines and ads and copy works. So we have both the cold audiences set. Okay, so now we're gonna do a new campaign. Sometimes I do separate campaigns, one for warm audiences and one for hot audiences. And how I define that is warm, I kind of think of as, hey, maybe they visited the Facebook page one time, maybe they followed you on Instagram or things like that. But a hot audience is like, hey, this person visited the checkout page. They went to go check out. Um, they almost made it to the end or they visited a sales page, even like the homepage. I would usually include in that. So for simplicity, I am going to do them in one campaign, but I'll probably do this one at ABO so I have a little more control of where that spend is going. So here is what we are going to set up. I'll often do warm and hot traffic separately, uh, often for a much bigger campaign, but in this example, we have three hot audiences and what that means is it's people who actually visited the website. Uh, sometimes it can be even they initiated checkout or got really close to buying. Uh, on this one, they visited a very specific product page, which is a really popular product. So we wanna get people back to that product page. And then this is high intent means that they spent a lot of time on the website. So as we show our original ads to more and more new people, it's gonna be adding to people who have engaged with us on Facebook or Instagram or watched a video or visited the different pages. So we're just gonna do these two. So that's the overview. And then we're gonna set this up in Facebook. 
We have one ad that is the same as last time, but we're gonna show three different ads. That way, when we're showing ads to new people, once they get added to these retargeting audiences, they're actually going to see fresh new videos and these videos and photos and things like that are a little more geared toward getting people to finish checkout uh, or a little bit more for people who are already at least a little bit familiar with the product. And yeah, we're gonna do the same four ads across these. Uh, this peanut butter page is a little bit more specific. Okay, so everything else is going to be the same except for I'm not gonna check CBO because I'm kind of gonna look at the different audience sizes and base the spend based off that. So, you know, if one audience has a thousand people, I'll maybe put a couple dollars a day. Um, this will happen somewhat automatically, but I just like that additional control, especially if I'm doing like add to cart. Let me quickly punch in the name of this campaign. All right, so we're gonna do warm slash hot, website and social, the date, um, ABO, website conversion. Uh, when you're testing like CBO versus ABO, just know like warm and hot traffic is definitely going to be a lot more profitable. So you don't wanna say, oh, ABO works much better, but you only did it for warm and hot traffic who already heard of you. Okay, so we can go to next. Uh, I'm gonna turn off detailed targeting expansion. I don't generally don't do that for warm and hot audiences. So daily budget, we can just leave that at $20 or somewhere around that. We're actually going to set each ad set budget later on after we duplicate all of them. Okay, so the first audience I'm going to create is people who spent a lot of time on the website and have visited in the last 30 days. So that'll be any website page. So I'm gonna to go to website. And then you wanna make sure you choose the correct pixel. So you have a number of options. You know, you can target specific pages. Uh, we're gonna do by the amount of time they spent on the website. So this will be people who are in the top 25%. So the quarter of people who spend the most time on our website. And then we'll do, yeah, in the last 30 days. And then I'm going to name it. So you name the audience. Uh, which is different than naming the ad set. Uh, you're naming the audience so you can select this audience at any point in the future. So we'll do high intent, 30 day, all visitors, since it's not a specific page. So we'll create that audience and then anytime we wanna use that in the future, you can go to all of your save audience will show up and you can select that again. Okay, so I named this high intent, 30 day, all pages, US 18 to 65, auto placement, auto bid. I'm gonna speed up the footage of myself setting up these ads, but you can go to the time code down below if you would still find the step-by-step -step instructions helpful. Okay, so now we have the high intent. We have all of our ads in there. So now we're ready to duplicate this audience several times to show it these four ads to different people. Okay, so this audience is going to be 31 to 180 days. So we're gonna see, the reason I sometimes do it like that is typically the 31 to 80 day is profitable, not quite as profitable as the 30 day but you can really see how well that audience does and if it's actually worth showing things to people all the way up to 180 days or if you just wanna stick with something like 30. So we're gonna remove that audience. We're gonna create a new one. We'll do it the same way as before, so website. I don't want it to actually overlap with the other audience. And I would use this if it was a website with pretty high traffic. Uh, if you have a lot less traffic, you'll probably wanna do like all website visitors. So we'll do visitors by time spent, top 25% in the past 180 days. And then we want to exclude people 
who have visited in the last 30 days. So we'll click exclude. Deserves by time spent in the last 30 days. So it'll be 31 to 180. So I'll name this audience so we can reference it later. High intent, 31 to 180 day, all website pages. Okay, create audience. Click done. Duplicate this again. So I'm gonna name this one peanut butter since these ads are specifically on the peanut butter page. So we'll create a custom audience for this as well. Go to create new custom audience website again. So for this one, it's people who visited a very specific page. So make sure the right pixel selected and then switch this to people who visited a specific page. You can also do like an event, like people who added to card or things like that. But for this one, the URL contains peanut butter. So any pages that contain peanut butter for this one is just the one sales page. And then generally I'll do the full 180 days, the max if it's like a very specific page because traffic for that is going to be lower. And just name this peanut butter page 180 days. Okay, so this peanut butter one, it's not going to show all four ads and we'll actually need to edit these various ads. So we don't want to show all four. We're just going to want to show these two. So from this campaign, we're actually going to want to delete the two we're not going to use. We could just delete it right here. Make sure you select the right ones. Delete them. All right, go to edits. So for this, we're actually going to keep the photo and stuff the same, but switch it to more peanut butter specific ones. So this is people who landed on the page. So, you know, you were so close to tasting our delicious waffles. So we'll change it to that because this is only going to target people who actually went to that page to potentially buy it, but didn't actually go through with it. And then for the URL, we want to actually make sure that this one goes toward peanut butter. So it, it will send them when they click on the link, it will go to peanut butter. And rather than learn more, I'll definitely do shop now. So then I'll just change the title. We use different primary text. All right, now that one's good to go. I'm gonna do the exact same steps for this one, making it specific to the peanut butter. Again, I'm going to go through the same steps we've been going through, setting up the ads and editing the placements. Okay, so I switched out the title. These two are good to go. So this audience ad set is set for the peanut butter. So we don't want to duplicate the peanut butter because that is specific to the page, but I can duplicate this one because the next audience is going to have the same ads. So these are our three hot audiences, people who visited specific pages or spent a lot of time on the website. We can just duplicate the full campaign. So I'll delete this audience here and I'll create a new one. So I'm going to do video views and what I find works really well for this, you know, the views may be not enough to retarget people. If it is videos you haven't like boosted or shown to a large audience, 
But what you can do is you run like a video ad to your cold traffic to new people. And then you put one of those videos in here so that as you spend tons and tons of money on that cold traffic, you're building up a ton of views, basically moving those people who watch a lot of the video from the cold audience into your retargeting, into your hot audience. So I generally do anywhere between 50 and 90%. I'll often do 365 days, it's up to you, that's the max. And then you can actually choose the specific videos, either Facebook videos or Instagram videos. So you can choose the exact Facebook page and select the exact video and anyone who's watched half of the video, it'll add to this audience. But that's also true going forward. So if you have a video that a lot of people are seeing going forward, you're gonna be adding more and more people to this audience. I will go to Instagram page. Is Instagram business profile. You can also find the exact video ID or campaign. So it will tell you the three second video views. So it would be less than this hitting 50%. So if it's 121, you know, it may be like 30 people who have watched it, but you can go through, you can select all your videos. You can select videos on a specific topic or ones you're currently running as an ad and create an audience basically based off of that. So we could click confirm. Then we just wanna name this audience. So we can do Instagram training videos. 365 day, 50% view. So for the potential reach, it's not uncommon for this to say that it's unavailable or just something vague, like it's under 1000 or saying it may get very little results, but you should kind of figure out how big that audience size is yourself. Like you should have Google analytics on your site or some way to track how many people visit each page. So you kind of know, Hey, this page got a thousand visits in the last week. So our audience size is going to be somewhere around the 1000 range and you can set your budget accordingly. So don't worry if it's giving you some sort of error, as long as you have an audience that you know has at least a couple hundred people, you're good to go. And you know, if it's an amazing audience who's really likely to buy, it's worth advertising to them, even if there's only 300 people in that audience. If it's people who actually almost checked out, you know, it's definitely worth spending a couple dollars a day to get in front of all those people again who came really, really close to buying. Okay, so I'm going to rename this to video view 50%. And then we did 365 day. Everything else stays the same. So that one is ready. I'm going to duplicate this now, create the one for Instagram. So those were video views. They're video views off Instagram, but it's different than just people who generally engaged with the channel. So I'm going to create a new custom audience. I'll go to Instagram account, then select the right account. And unless you have a huge audience, I usually just leave this as everyone who engaged with it. That kind of includes people who sent messages or things like that. Um, if you have a really big audience, you could do like 30 days or 60 days. You know, I just have a couple thousand subscribers. So I think 365 days is going to work really well. So I'll just call it Instagram engagement 365 days and create that audience. And then I'll just change this to Instagram engagement, then delete the copy. Everything else is the same. Duplicate the Instagram one. The final one we're going to do is another warm audience. It's people who 
engage with us on Facebook. So I'll delete this audience. So I'm gonna go to create new custom audience. Now we'll do Facebook page. This is pretty much the same as Instagram page. So this is kind of the blanket term uh, for people who have interacted in any way. And unless you have a huge, huge audience, you'll probably just leave it as that. So you can see includes people who have visited your page or taken an action on a post or ad, such as reactions, shares, comment, link, click, anything like that. Okay, so I'll leave this as 365 days. You know, I just have under a thousand, so I will call this Facebook engagement 365 days. I call it something slightly different if it was just like people who sent a message or some of the other ones. This would be specific to ads, not just your regular one. And this can be like messages and things like that. So we'll create this audience and we'll be able to use these at any point in the future. Okay, and this will stay the same. Facebook engagement, 365 days. So I have these six audiences targeting people who have watched specific videos or engaged in Facebook or visited certain pages. Now I want to select the budget. So I am doing ABO just because these are really small audiences. And I kind of just want to get in front of everyone in the audience a few times per week. You know, if you're hitting people with ads 20 times a week, the results can really go down. Um, so the reason I'm not using CBO is let's say one of these audiences is very, very small and I can just spend a dollar or two a day to get in front of people. I wouldn't want it kind of diverting a lot of money to that if it's doing well, um, but burning out that audience. So let me show you how to access the audiences that we created. You can just go to business home and then go to audiences. Here we have all the audiences we created, even going back a ways. We can actually edit them while we're here, go into them. And these are so recent that it's still pending. But, you know, often for these really smaller audiences, it'll just say below 1000, which isn't incredibly helpful. So let me go back to the ad account. I usually can do some calculations myself to give me a good idea of what the spending should be. So those audience sizes are just an estimate. I've definitely had audiences that have over 5,000 people where it's still said the estimates below 1,000. So I'm just gonna set the budget kind of based off wanting to get in front of everyone in this audience, you know, maybe two to five times per week. Uh, if you show it to people too many times, they may get kind of burned out and your results will go down. But, you know, these are the best possible people to show it to. And you want to, them to see your different ads when it's fairly recent in their minds or things like that. So this is all an estimate and you don't have to get the small audiences just right. But I did make this little cheat sheet that should be helpful. This is generally the range I'm finding in my ad account. So it costs for a thousand impressions, costing seven to $22. So to reach each person in that audience around once, we're looking at spending one to $3 per day. So if you had an audience of 300 people and you wanted to reach them around three times per week, you'd look to spend one to $3 a day. If the audience is more like a thousand, you spend three times that much, aiming for 3000 impressions and three to $9 in spend per day. Now, if you have an absolutely huge audience, like let's say a quarter million Instagram followers, you probably wouldn't try to reach that entire audience every single week, but you may look at hitting, you know, something like 50,000 impressions, spending somewhere around $50 or $100 a day, if that's an amazing audience and it's generating a lot of sales. This isn't a precise thing. It's not like if you have an audience of 1,000 and get 3,000 impressions, every single person will have seen it exactly three times. But generally, just about everyone in the audience will have seen it and likely seen it multiple times. 
You also want to consider when we're showing ads to cold traffic, we are adding a lot of website visitors or video views or people who have interacted with us to these warm and hot audiences. So this is also a ballpark that if we're spending $100 a day on those cold audience ads, we'd be adding 200 website visitors. The amount you pay for link clicks really varies. I've seen it as low as 15 cents all the way up to close to $2. It'll depend on your ads, industry, when you're running it, all things like that. I'm also estimating if we spend $100 in ads and half of our budget is going toward videos, we generate an additional 1,000 people who viewed 50%. Um, and then with Instagram engagement, it tends to be around the range of link clicks. So with this first audience, we're going to say it's 1000 people, but we'll be adding an additional 2000. So we're looking at 3000 people. I want to reach each person. We'll say around 3000 times. So we're looking around the range of 10,000 impressions. So I'll do on the lower end of the range and check frequency. I'm just going to set this at 12. I'm also gonna add frequency to my column so I can see on average how many times people in this audience have seen the ad. So I will check this every single day and I'll adjust the budget if the frequency is too low or too high. And I'm going to estimate the other audiences. I'm also planning on keeping it around $75 per day in total. So I'm gonna factor that in as well. We have everything set and ready to go. We're gonna be spending around $220 a day over the next week or two. Often I'll go through the different campaigns and just double check my work one more time. And then you can go to review and publish. And once you hit publish, it will send all your ads to Facebook where they'll either be approved or disapproved. And once they're approved, your campaigns will be live and it will be spending money. Very briefly, I do wanna cover the learning phase. So when you launch new ads, it will say learning. So it's learning who to show it to, how to optimize for conversions. And then generally within a few days, sometimes a week, it will move to either learning limited or active. So for learning limited, it'll say this ad set is not generating enough purchases to exit the learning phase. This usually occurs when your ad set is limited by cost control, budget, audience size, other settings or things like that. So a general rule of thumb is if you're generating at least 50 results per ad set in a week, it should get out of the learning phase. Based off personal experience, I think people put a little too much weight in the learning phase. Like certainly for ad sets that are generating a lot of purchases and getting better and better at finding the right people, I have seen better results. However, sometimes it will move to learning limited or active within like an hour or something crazy like that. Some of my all time top performing ads are learning limited or I'll have ads that say active that are underperforming. So really, I think the most important thing is you're trying to generate a decent amount of sales so it can get better and better at optimizing for that. We have that launched and ready to go. Now we need our ads to be approved by Facebook. Okay, so here is what we're going to do next. I'm going to keep track of the different ads, the different campaigns, and how many purchases they are bringing in. I'm not gonna be too worried, especially after like one day. And I'm not gonna be worried about an ad that hasn't spent the amount I'd like to get a customer for. So if it's spent $40 and hasn't generated a sale, but I'm fine with 50, I'm not gonna worry until it hits 50 and a little bit over, and then I'll think about pausing it. But I usually re let it run at least a couple days so I have a good indicator. And then several days later, you can think about pausing different ads and different ad sets that are performing really, really poorly. Um, so then you can funnel more of the money into the winning ads. It'll do that somewhat automatically with like the CBO, but sometimes I do like to turn off ads that are just doing terrible. And I wanna be, during this time, I wanna be creating new ads and kind of learning from what's working and trying to roll out new ads and new creative. I'm always spending at least 10% on testing new ads, but if things really aren't working well, it could be like 50%, 60%, 80%. At what point would I be nervous? Well, if it's been like $300 in spend and I've got like zero purchases, I'm gonna think about pausing it or kind of going back to the drawing board or things like that, 
or if we spent a thousand dollars and generated a hundred dollars of purchases that's really bad you know if we spend fifteen hundred and we've generated 950 in sales that's a little disappointing but still has some potential and i'm gonna try to keep bringing it to profitable Definitely check out that 18 day Facebook ads course. It has so many exclusive trainings and resources and workbooks. It's awesome. You are amazing for making it to the end. I'll have a little playlist come up with some of my top Facebook videos, but hopefully I'll see you in that course.